Uh, let's see. To do this, oh wait, one second. I got it. I got it. Can be done. All right, and then there we go. Can everybody see the uh, what's what's on the screen? Oh, perfect. Uh, again, we just want to thank you. Uh, Tessa and I want to thank all of you for gifting us your time. Uh, we know how busy it is uh, during these days, uh, but thank you again for gifting us your time and the opportunity for us to share a little bit about our, uh, our services that we can uh, provide to you and your communities. And so this is us, the infection prevention control uh, team is, well, the team being just Tessa and myself <laughs> at this time being. Um, but it, it's okay because uh, of the work that we do, um, it makes sense. And um, well, IPC, I think sometimes people uh, normally associate infection prevention control with uh, acute care facilities. And, and that's where most of the examples we think uh, occurs from because you, you see that huge presence of IPC in, in, uh, in hospital settings. But we like to kind of explain also that that's not all that IPC is all about. That's one little piece of IPC. And there's other pieces of IPC that it's much broader that extends beyond the hospital to even schools and daycare facilities and in all kinds of facilities as well. Because it's all about where people are and, and the interaction between people and the interaction be, uh, between people and environment is where IPC elements uh, are present. And so this is a little collage of uh, what some of the little things that we do. Um, wanted to make a bigger collage, but it's very new to making collages. So just bear, bear with this picture as it's kind of like a newbie way of doing it. And so you can see here, there's things like we do UV uh, assessments, um, which helps with education for cleaning and disinfection of your EVS technicians or environmental services technicians. Uh, we do a lot of the assessments of infrastructure, uh, for example, looking at the design uh, elements in, inside a facility to see if it actually meets best practices and minimum requirements for infection prevention control standards uh, for healthcare facilities and, and other facilities as well. Uh, some, sometimes we do some innovative kind of uh, new way of doing things, like at the top right hand corner. When, uh, when we were running out of N95 respirators in the, in the province, and we had to go to uh, something called the elastomeric uh, respirators. Uh, we had to develop a whole new way of how do we process them because it wasn't really designed for that. And so, and, and teaching and education, so you can see in, in these pictures. I just want to add um, for elaboration that UV is ultraviolet light. That's uh, on the top left-hand corner there where Daniel is shining. Uh, the, that purpley hue um, to check for the markings that we put as a teaching tool for the, and the EVS used to be called the custodian or janitorial staff or housekeeping staff in facilities. And reprocessing is um, how you clean and disinfect so that items could be reused. Thank you. Thank you, Tess. And this is us, uh, just again, uh, our, our pictures, but you can't see our faces here <laughs> facing this video. And uh, this is the IPC team. Uh, our goal in IPC is always to partner uh, with, uh, with our stakeholders, uh, which is yourself and your communities. Uh, we don't lead it. It is you who are leading us, letting us know what it is that you want to achieve and in your goals for each of the facilities that you have, or even the workflow. And for us to be able to use our knowledge in IPC and, and logistics and, and other uh, experience that we have to be able to provide options, as many options as possible that will help uh, suit your needs. And sometimes we even, and we have experienced many times in, when we're in community that we come up with, and this is what we like to do is come up with solutions together. And sometimes there could be like completely out of the box, very innovative, but it still follows the, the best practices of IPC concepts. And so we do a lot of, um, and lately we've been doing a lot of consultation on new builds uh, and renovations, major renovations, because it is cheaper actually to like do it right the first time than to have to um, have to go, oh yeah, we, we can't have that kind of sink. How, how do we replace that sink? Uh, it, it's more costly that way when you have to do major renovations and you, know, you already spent the money 
now you kind of have to add more money into it. So when it comes to design and renovations, we always say the best time to involve us, and this is what capital assets and facilities management is doing, is involve us before um, the first stone is laid. That way, that way you're not looking at major rentals uh, later on uh, in the process, which can be very, very expensive. But IPC, again, um, we kind of wrote down what is IPC. Like, if you come from the East, East, they call it IPAC. They actually use the acronym for the AN, you know, Infection Prevention and Control. Uh, in the States, you might, down, down further south, you might hear IC, which is Infection Control. Uh, here on the West Coast, it's an Infection Prevention Control, IPC. So those are all the same terminology for, for our program and services. We do a lot of in-person consultations, again, a lot of building design and renovations. We also do supplementary teachings uh, for your EBS, environmental services technicians, in knowing how to clean and disinfect. As Tess was mentioning, they're not just housekeepers or, or custodians. The environmental services technicians in your facility are at a, at a higher level because their knowledge has to be higher, their responsibility is higher. They're dealing with a very unique environment which, has, which is a vulnerable environment with vulnerable uh, clients. And therefore, uh, their knowledge base has to be a step higher and also their activities are, are much more stringent than those in commercial or residential facilities. So we do offer, testing to myself, uh, we offer uh, the supplementary training in infection control for EBS technicians uh, to communities if, if, when requested. And, uh, and that also, we, we use the UV kind of a, a teaching tool as well to help them understand some of the basic concepts. And staff and client safety is another thing. Workflow, administrative controls, engineer controls, those are things that we also help uh, facilities kind of navigate uh, and, and come up with options of how to uh, implement it effectively that meets your needs. And when we talk about uh, IPC, um, I, I like to use a story uh, to illustrate the freedom of concepts. And uh, I, I'm, a, I'm an outrigger paddler. I do it competitively or until, until the uh, pandemic happened, then we kind of had to disband for a long time. But um, I, I do outrigger paddling, I love it. I have my own solo boat. Uh, this is my team out in Hawaii. We were doing the rough waters out in, uh, in Kona, off the coast. And, uh, and I remember when I, when I first, uh, when my wife and I first got our, our solo boats, uh, and they were a different design than, than the clubs. We were paddling, 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 and we weren't getting anywhere. Uh, we were like, wow, what a struggle it was just to get the boat moving. Because everybody in the club uh, with their other versions of the boat were like, oh, yeah, you got to paddle this way, like up front, and this is how you do it. And we're like, okay. But we kept trying and trying and trying. It was like, no, the boat was just fighting us all the time. And then we realized... Uh, later, when we clicked on the video of the person who designed our boats, he was telling us this boat likes it a full backstroke. We're like, huh, interesting. And so we tried that and the boat was just gliding like crazy. It was just flying. It was doing exactly what it was uh, meant to do. And so there was that kind of like in, in our club, they're like, oh, you guys are doing it wrong. But we're like, but we're flying, we're moving. And there's these different kind of concepts. And what I want to illustrate here is, is IPC concept and IPC itself is not rigid. It's not saying that this is the only way that it can be done and only can be done. Now, a novice IPC practitioner and some of those in, in our field might, might stick with that. And I remember in, in, uh, when I was a manager at the Fraser Health uh, Infection Control Program, uh, I was trying to orientate one of the new staff, new IPC practitioners, and we were looking at a sink. And uh, this is another illustration. We were looking at a sink and this IPC practitioner using their knowledge of IPC concepts and what they have learned in school and in IPC school and, and looking at CSA standards, the old CSA standards, like, no, you got to make sure the entire countertop is cleared up. You can't because it's within a splash zone. And of course, space is a commodity in, in, a lot of these, uh, in a lot of the healthcare facilities. And I can just see it in the eyes of, of that, man that unit manager. I, I can see it like, you know, she's already thinking about where to bury us in, in the backyard. I'm like, well, <laughs> we can't be that rigid uh, with, with these concepts and what we 
suggest to people. And, but the IPC concept that, that this, this young practitioner was saying, well, it kind of made sense because if you look at a sink, there is the splash zone. Splash zone is actually where water kind of sprays off to the side and you can see droplets and it's usually about a meter around uh, the, the sink. Uh, and therefore things around the sink become contaminated. But a lot of times you just can't remove everything because again, you don't have room for everything. So what can we do? So the suggestion was using IPC concepts of cross-contamination, let's control the cross-contamination itself. Instead of trying to remove things, let's control it, control its spread. And that's where these come in. These are called splash guards. And so instead of telling the nurse, hey, remove everything, you, you can't have anything here. Let's put these, let's erect these proper splash guards on either side of the sink. And now you just save all that space on either side of the sink. And you have contained the source of the cross-contamination. So this is what this is an illustration of you know, trying to think outside the box and not being very rigid. And, and Tess and I try to kind of apply these concepts wherever we go and try to think it's like, you know, here's these concepts. We still need to follow these concepts, but there are different ways of actually achieving it and achieving IPC best practices and still be able to pass your accreditation uh, if, you, if you do choose to go down that route. Another thing is we also suggest about breaking away from the mold. Uh, to oh, sorry, what can I just sense. add yes, something, Daniel? Can you please go back to the yes. previous picture? And Daniel and I, when we provide recommendations, we do it in a holistic way. So for example, the splash guard that you could see, we would emphasize to the team that we're speaking with to round out the edges so that um, cuts and uh, abrasions and those kinds of things are prevented um, because we look at it from a holistic point of view, incorporating uh, infection prevention and control and occupational health and safety for this example that you could see in the picture. Yeah, rounding out the edges are, are very important. Um, I don't know if you can see it, but I got cut with one of these <laughs> with a plexiglass barrier because of the sharp edges. Uh, definitely round it out. Plexiglass is very easy to obtain now these days. Before it was really hard because everybody was trying to grab as much plexiglass as possible, but now it's a little bit easier. And you can even self-install it, uh, cut it with a jigsaw and stuff like that and round, round the sides. But these are simple solutions. You can even buy from Walmart too, I think, uh, splash cards too now. Uh, breaking away from the mold and going with what makes sense. Um, we see a lot of places still have this paper on their, uh, on their examination bed, but what does it really do? It's like, it, it fits on like maybe three fifths of the table. So the edges are still exposed. When a person sits on it, it kind of shifts and moves. When they try to adjust their bum, it starts ripping down the middle. Like, what does it really do? Now, historically, long time ago, and the sheets used to be bigger to us, well, they used to kind of provide some kind of protection of some sort to the examination table, but really, as you can see, it really doesn't do much of anything other than make it look like an Oreo cookie. So uh, what we suggest is, you know, if you wanna save some money, you don't even need that sheet on there. These are now, a lot of the examination tables are now vinyl coated or they're made of vinyl or pleather uh, material, which is easily wipeable and disinfectable. If you don't have it, it actually makes it easier to do that step of cleaning and disinfecting the table between, um, between client visits. And, and it'll save you some money as well uh, in that sense. So those kind of practical things. And, and I, we understand that some people go, oh, well, the table is kind of very cold on, on somebody's bum. Um, well, there's other ways, other things you can kind of apply there to make it more comfortable for their bum. Uh, sorry, using the word bum, but for their behind uh, if needed. But this, sometimes what happens is people get a false sense of security from the paper. And they're like, oh yeah, it's, it's clean because I put a new roll on. Well, not really because it doesn't cover the whole entire table. So it cannot, it cannot uh, negate the need for you know, that constant cleaning and disinfection between clients for the examination table. Uh, curtains is another thing that we see a lot of. Uh, hospitals are trying to get away from this now uh, because the number of times that the curtains are actually clean is frighteningly very uh, minimal. 
And uh, and I'm sure probably some of you have seen stains and stuff like that on these curtains. It's like, ooh, how often have these been really clean? Uh, the, the sad truth is not really often. And unless you're cleaning it daily or between client, client visits, you know, there is a high chance of it being a source of cross-contamination. But there's other things that we can recommend to replace curtains, these traditional kind of curtains uh, or, yeah, privacy curtains. And there's new technology out there with actual solid screens or vinyl screens that you pull out. You can even add really beautiful designs like nature and everything uh, or whatever you want on it that's easily wipeable and disinfectable. So those are the things that's kind of like, let's break away from the things that we have, had, you know, that we used long, long, long time ago, like three or four decades ago that we still use today uh, and think about what, what we have learned, all these learnings, and what can we do today to kind of mitigate some of these sources of cross-contamination or things that give us a false sense of security. Um, Tess, anything you want to add here? No, that's the highlight of this um, breaking from the mold and then looking at innovative ways to uh, solve some issues or concerns. And if you can see right beside, it's hard to tell, but right beside a curtain, um, it's a cork board and we try to, uh, uh, well, the recommendation or actually the requirement now these days, but the rec our recommendation is to not have cork boards in those highly vulnerable areas like the chemical spaces because they are such a, you know, grabby kind of a material that loves to absorb all the bacteria and, and, and uh, other microorganisms and it's very hard to clean and disinfect. So uh, those are to be avoided as well. But those are some of the things that we suggest. But uh, at the same time, we also you know, work with, with our stakeholders to make sure that it makes sense for them as well. Um, for example, wood. Wood is a beautiful thing to make an area welcoming. Um, and, and we sometimes get the question, can we use wood? Like in, in a healthcare facility, and we're like, yeah, you can use wood as long as it's treated and stuff. It's just, again, the concept is, is it easily wipeable and disinfectable and making sure that it's non-porous uh, so that it can be wipeable and disinfectable easily. The other thing that I could see from that picture, Daniel, mm, um, yeah. sorry, if you could just go back. Yes, is the blind covering, the window covering in that is the slatted vertical blinds, which is again, very difficult to clean in an examination area. So another service that the infection prevention and control team um, is product selection. And so we usually recommend, recommend the non-porous and more durable vinyl or, or some other materials um, that are also in one piece rather than this one, many pieces of slats. Um, so the other, the roller blinds would be so much easier to clean as long as it's not made with non-porous or fabric um, materials. Thanks. Thanks, Tess. Yeah, it's about making the, the right choice the easy choice. It's like, how often do we clean such a thing? I don't even clean that in our, in our own house because it's so difficult to get through each and every little slat. Whereas if it was like a, a vinyl kind of roll down, it's like, oh, that's easy. I just take a disinfectant wipe, I'm done. And it makes it very, very easy to do. Uh, we call this the Google search issue. Um, Sometimes it's very, very hard to come up with the, the, the right question. And, and if for, for anybody who has done a lot of Google searching, you probably have experienced this before, like there may be something that you wanna ask Google, but you're not sure what the right terminology or, or how or what, really, what the specifics are to ask Google to get you the answers. And so you type in, so we type in these, these, uh, these questions and it spits out like numerous results that really has nothing related to what we want in the first place. Uh, but you know, the problem is, this is it's just a database. If you if we type in the right question, then we get the things. Well, most of the time, we get the things that we uh, that we want. Uh, so it's about getting to the right questions, and that's that's what we're here for. Is is also having these conversations so that we can help um, with the the question and maybe even determine what it is that that it is that you're looking for. Yeah, from our perspective, from our vantage point uh, with, with our IPC knowledge. Um, and so, and sometimes it's, um, it's even not the formal conversations that happen uh, that, we, that we're able to help. It's more sometimes of these casual conversations that we're part of. And we hear things like, oh, 
is this what you're asking? And they're like, yeah, that's it. That's what I'm asking for. And these are the, the conversations that we like to have and be involved with, uh, with our stakeholders, because uh, sometimes it's those conversations that kind of like, yeah, you get those brain juices working and, and get all these ideas flowing and, and can kind of at least know what it is that uh, we're looking for. And that leads us to this picture here. I, I love this picture. This, this picture, uh, uh, took it off from, from the website, of course, is it's about this process of getting to what it is that uh, uh, our stakeholders actually are looking for. And sometimes it's actually kind of difficult, especially if they don't know what that question or, or how to word it in the first place. And so looking at um, uh, picture two, three, four, and, and five, uh, this is kind of very typical. You, you see this in a lot of the you know, project management and design uh, processes is everybody comes from a different discipline. So they will see it from that discipline's vantage point. But it not, may not be the, the, that thing that uh, the person actually is wanting or the stakeholder is wanting. And so you go through all these process and then of course it gets really costly uh, uh, with the bill, but it didn't really have to be because at the end it was really something much more simple than what was thought of. And so we found that with our, from our experiences in working with a lot of our stakeholders, it's about getting to 12 very quickly, but collaboratively, because again, we don't hold all the answers either. And so we, we really, as Tess said, we try to work things in a very holistic way. It's like, we try to use our knowledge in IPC and other experiences that we have, but when we notice like, hmm, this is a little something else that we can involve other people, we try to grab people and going, hey, occupational health and safety, hey, environmental health officers, hey, uh, other people, can you like uh, chime in here? So we have this collective kind of brain power working at working these problems through and trying to understand, first of all, the, the issue or the challenge and then coming up with a better solution. But yeah. The other thing that I would like to add is that when Daniel and I are in community or even when we're discussing before or after we, we do the in-person walkthroughs, um, we also ask the question, how have you been successful in any similar circumstances before? So we draw the answers from our collaborators who are from community because you know what um, resource resources are sustainable and accessible to you. And you also know how you procure those things and how to avail of the services of, say, for example, people who might construct something you are in the know. So you are very much involved in the discussion process so that uh, the outcome would be something that was what you are aiming for. Mm -hmm. uh, one good example was one community we went to, um, there was, uh, they, they had a waiting area, but the seat cushions were not, uh, were not uh, uh, waterproof or water resistant, so to say. It was a cloth material. And so it was a common waiting area for their center and they wanted it to be uh, to be waterproof because they wanted to be disinfected uh, easily and which is a great, you know, it's best practice. As we're like, oh, what can we do? What can we do? And the alternative was like, let's think of maybe some kind of cover that can be washed daily, but what kind of cover? And one of the suggestions by one of the, uh, one of the people that we're talking to is like, hey, look at these, uh, what is it? The infant bed that she, covers right the ones that are nicely fitted and, and a lot of them are waterproof and etc it's like can we use those like wow great solution and and so we also use that and kind of provide that option to other people as well as we're all learning from each other uh, from our experiences because again we don't hold all the answers we have ipc concepts but again once again it's about the application can be done differently in, in a variety of ways in creative ways uh, and so um, this is how we work with everybody to be able to uh, find these solutions that, that work for everyone. And Tess is going to talk about some of our uh, partnerships that we have had. So um, we asked the people in these pictures for permission to be able to share the pictures um, in our presentations, whether it's for educational or marketing purposes. And so um, Daniel and I have visited these communities. Uh, let's start with the upper left corner there with the Lilwat First Nations. Um, we have visited um, with their request to first assess the workflow 
and then also to think about innovations in how they disinfect their health center because they provide many services. This is a new health center. So we also were consulted in terms of product selection and the post the post reconstruction, post construction design of, of these facilities. Um, so it involved a whole lot of the services that we offer that Lilwat uh, Health Leadership availed of with regards to um, first the walkthrough, going through the entire health center. Um, we were asking them about how they use um, the spaces and what are the purposes of the spaces what kinds of interactions happen there? Is it only staff to staff? Is it staff to customers or clients, which are some suppliers and vendors, and also the staff, um, nursing and otherwise who are engaging with community members in those uh, examination rooms or, or assessment rooms or interview rooms. And sometimes there's also boardroom for meetings and education. So we provide advice on how cleaning and dis disinfection can happen. And also they have continuously communicated with us with regards to some of the other things we offer. And then they were reviewing our reports and said, oh, what about these innovative ways? And so uh, we are exploring a um, project with them with regards to how we could do cleaning and disinfection so that we could maximize the time of the environmental services technician. And yet at the same time, not have too much um, uh, uh, like overly spending all their time in cleaning and disinfection. So there are various ways of, of doing this in, in respect to applying innovative, innovative ways. And you're going to be hearing more about this as the project uh, progresses. Um, the Lacolams Nursing Station uh, invited us for a renovation after Blackwater flooded the, the clinical areas. And so uh, infection prevention control does not only happen during the regular times, we could also assist in terms of when there's uh, natural disasters. And so because they experience heavy, heavy rains for many days, they have um, had this flooding and it has affected their, their nursing station. And so Daniel and I were called to do the, again, the walkthrough assessment. We went through the process of interviewing people um, about the use and how else um, have they done something like this before? What kind of solutions did they employ? And, and then we have to also include the, their facilities management director because they have been involved in these kinds of uh, procurement of services and all that. So in terms of collaboration in the community, that's one example that we have done. And it's a continuous process. We didn't just end by the, the end of day of the visit there, but we also continue to provide communication and explanations and some other suggestions after the report has been given um, so that if the people who are going there to do reconstruction and renovation, we were still able to give advice on how to do, say, for example, proper hoarding to avoid uh, sick, sick building syndrome for the staff who are still coming to work. Then I William, wanna, sorry, mm -hmm. I just want to add to Lockwell, um, uh, just as uh, Tess uh, mentioned, uh, the hoarding. So what, what that is about is there is um, proper infection control um, uh measures that is needed especially when doing during construction doing construction and preparing for construction renovations in a healthcare facility so what we have found was um uh well we had to do some education there uh to to some of the builders uh, etc and how to do it properly because you they don't want you don't want that cross contamination of fomites and dust and particulates and um what had happened was there was a case where people were actually um, coughing and having respiratory issues due to uh, fine and coarse uh, particulates from demolition that was going on because of improper hoarding uh, and improper measures of uh, during construction. So those are things that we uh, help and provide education on as well. Thanks, Beth. Thank you. And the next one is the Williams Lake primary care design. Um, the Williams Lake area has a primary care center that is newly built and uh, Daniel and I were requested to have a walkthrough to see if all of the items, fit up items and the construction is according to IPC best practices. And so we were able to interact with the regional um, project manager there and um, was able to provide some 
um, praises for the great things that were included in how they constructed this facility and also um, some examples where they could um, improve on. For example, the height of the sharps container is a little too high for people to access safely, those kinds of things. And so um, in this, there's going to be many primary care centers that are going to be erected in the province. And we would love to interact with you and engage with you if you are in one of those communities who are going to have a primary care center. Um, maybe you are in the blueprints early, early stage of um, construction. And uh, if you wanted to avail of our services for consultation, please feel free to do so. Anything to add for Williams Lake? Daniel? Well, it was just a great opportunity to be able to be involved in, uh, in, in the primary care. Um, and again, uh, just even here, for example, in the, in the Williams Lake, there are things that um, unfortunately will have to be taken down. <laughs> so, uh, and unfortunately can't be returned for, for, for the money spent. But, you know, early on, early on um, in involvement uh, with, with all stakeholders, uh, including IPC, is good to actually kind of look through and make sure that um, well, what is purchased is, uh, can be applicable. And, and Thank you. The next one is the Iskut nursing station. Here we were requested to provide education or supplementary training for the environmental services technician. And um, we were advised that the person will be needing language support. And so we were able to find um, um, an American Sign Language provider who is also indigenous. So she was able to interact more effectively with the environmental services technician who is needing that support. And uh, we're, we're proud that, uh, that when we are given challenges, Daniel and I would do our best to source out appropriate resources and support so that we could deliver the services to the best way that would fit the community and the people that we're providing supplementary education for. So um, through the help of the language support interpreter, she was able to tell us in terms of how much uh, she was able to explain to the environmental services technician so that the rest of it, um, Daniel and I can do by showing um, demo and return demo to, to ensure that the person who is doing the work for this nursing station is supported in, the, in her cleaning and disinfection. So um, again, another innovative way of delivering the services through the help of other supports in the community. The Penticton Indian Band was a multi-facility assessment request. We assessed, I think, eight facilities in that community. Um, what was great was the person who is uh, shaking hands with Danielle there in the photo. She has implemented many parts of the public health and infection prevention and control um, uh, uh, best practices that she has been made aware of during the pandemic season. And um, she wanted us to ensure that, um, that the facilities that they have implemented these processes for are up to snuff with the best practices and CSA standards and all of that. And we were so impressed with the, the efforts of the entire community in terms of prevention of infection anywhere where people, people to people, people to environment interact so that their community will be safe. Because the Penticton Indian Band facilities also service the Penticton greater community um, as part of their generous extension of the other services that would be appropriate. So we are grateful for that opportunity and, um, and, and able to um, provide that support and continue with, again, not just ending with the submission of the report, but further supports and explanations after receiving the recommendations. And we are grateful for continuous partnerships with them. And the last picture here is the Sekidene nursing station. Um, they have their, in their location, it's a very old facility that is, um, they are planning to build another facility to replace this. But in the meantime, these existing facility need to be safe and usable for those who are in it, the staff and the community members who are accessing services. And so here in the picture, Daniel is um, providing supplementary education to the environmental services technician, um, showing the 
ultraviolet light uh, as a review and uh, training tool in terms of uh, cleaning and disinfection of high touch surfaces in, in the examination rooms. Is there anything you would like to add, Daniel, for this one? Uh, no, uh, well, this, this one was, um, as you can see, it was, it was pretty urgent because um, there was uh, some issues that we kind of had to kind of all pull together and head up there. So they, they, these things do happen. And, uh, and we try to make ourselves available uh, for that as well. But thank you so much, Tess. All right, and, uh, and questions. Um, does anybody have any questions for us? Uh, if you need to contact us, um, our, oh, I should have put it in there. Uh, give me a second. Actually, I, I don't have that screen anymore, Tess. Can you type it into chat? Is, uh, sure. You can contact us at ipc at fmha.ca. Yes, and for the process of, of uh, requesting our services, it's a, an email to these ipc at fmha.ca. And then we follow up with the contacting you with regards to the details of the service request. And then we try to arrange for um, what you need from us in order for us to be able to enter your community. Because when Daniel and I were providing services during pandemic, as we are considered essential services, uh, we are being, some of the communities have requested us to fill out forms so that we can enter community and it will involve things like screening for COVID symptoms and whether um, the status of our vaccination and who, are, who is our primary contact and then requesting for arrangement for accommodations and those kinds of details, particularly in areas where there's nursing stations and the accommodations are only within the community and not those uh, commercial hotels nearby. So we do talk about those um, logistics and and then follow up with you with regards to making sure we understood what was being requested. Thank you, Tess and Daniel. Um, yes, yeah, so if anybody, I know we did have a couple that just joined us. I understand there was another webinar, um, if not more. So thanks for joining. Um, and as a reminder, we are recording the session. Um, it will be on our website by the end of the week and any documents that Tess and Dan want to send along as well. Um, but any question, now is your time to ask. It's quiet out there. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's a good thing, I guess. Um, all right, I will um, going to...